talk tonight. We're continuing on with our series about the compassion of Christ. And tonight we're going to talk about compassion cares. Chuck Mattern, a solutions architect, um, role leader, wrote, um, wrote an article asking if a cashless society could become a compassionless society. In his article, he noted how that more and more that he found himself using cards instead of cash. And in his article, he said, he said this, you know, he found himself doing this for the convenience and the recording of spending. He said it was only when that his children needed money for school or someone near him was in need of assistance and he had no cash on him that he started thinking about the fact that not everyone accepts Visa, MasterCard, or American Express. Hmm. He forgot to discover. <laughs> 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 he, he then began to look at his giving electronically for church and charities. And he said that there were the obvious advantages of scheduling his donations. He said because they were always on time and, you know, he didn't forget them. But he began to question as to whether it was a good thing or not. Okay. He questioned himself as to whether giving, and thus was his, his giving to God and things, if giving should be something to which he didn't need to give any thought. Because just scheduling it just took the thinking out of it. It wasn't, I'm giving it was an automated thing, out of sight, out of mind. Okay. So, you know, he was given no thought to his giving to, um, to church or charities. And he said that what really bothered him was when he realized the cycle that had begun to happen. He said, first, he found himself in a situation where he would normally give, but had no cash. And he said, so then he was annoyed with himself for not being prepared. Sure. Later on, he found himself just shrugging his shoulders and promising himself, oh, I'll come back to it. And he said, finally, he found himself just saying, I don't carry cash. As if that it were some sort of a moral justification. And he said, from there, it was no big leap to go from that point to the frustration of how dare someone in need be in my presence? Mm. Oh my. He said, he then began to think of and question the famous quotes that we know of, it's the thought that counts. And he said, really? Does a thoughtless gift count? And then the one, God loves a cheerful giver. And he asked the question, and how much does God love a thoughtless giver? Okay. He went on to say, be careful what you automate. Yeah. You just might automate your own soul. 
So you may wonder why I'm starting off with this particular article. I told you that um, we were going to talk about compassion cares. <laughs> and then I start off talking about a cashless society being a compassionless society. But I'm not... I'm not even really talking about automating our bills, okay? That, that's, that's not even at all where I'm going, and I'm not trying to say that that's a bad thing for your bills to be automated. But Mr. Matter, in questioning himself, was bringing to us all that it is possible to get to the point in our lives where first there are people with needs, but we come to a point of being annoyed with ourselves for being unprepared to help them. Okay. Then we move into a maybe later, maybe another time. Oh, I'll circle back to them at some point and stepping into the next part of morally justifying all the reasons why we can't help, why we won't help, and then finally getting to an angry, uncaring attitude of how dare somebody with a need be in my presence? Why? Because we're so busy. We're busy with life. We're, we're busy with our work. We're busy with what's going on. And we're, we're just buzzing on through, um, through life. And using his point of what that he was talking about, because a cashless, contactless society even among Christianity, becomes a compassionless, uncaring society. All right. It's hard to care for people if you are never in contact with them. Right. If you're busy, you're bypassing them in life. Uh -huh. Reverend James Lumpkin, in a teaching a session in which I was an attendee, asked the question, when is a man a failure? A man a failure. When is a person a failure? And then as he continued, he said, he gave the answer to the question, when he doesn't care, when he doesn't share, when he doesn't try, and when he doesn't believe that what he is doing will work. So, I'm bringing to us tonight, in this lesson, summing those all up, and you'll see as, as we're going along, that I'm taking those and I'm putting them all together and I'm saying when is a person a failure? When they have no compassion. Because it requires compassion for us to care for us to share, for us to try to minister to a need, uh -huh. and for us to believe that what we're trying is actually going to have an effect. Right. Eight months after the article was published, Mr. Mattern came back and he called himself out by relaying a situation where he had an opportunity to reach out to someone and to help them. He said that he had, he had walked past someone and then 
he said he made eye contact with them. They they looked one another straight in the eyes and and made eye contact. And um, he said then he went on and he walked past. And he said, but he heard he heard the man call out to him and say, Sir. And he turned around thinking maybe he had dropped, you know, something or, or whatever. And the man the man spoke with him for just a moment and actually what he said to him is he said I'm not able to go into this building where Mr. Mattern was getting ready to go in. He said, I'm not able to go into this building. He said, but if I can, if I can go in with you, they'll, they'll let me in. If you would just buy me a sandwich and maybe talk to me for a few minutes. And, um, Mr. Mattern said that he reached in, reached in his pocket and just pulled out the cash that he had and just handed it to the man. And he said, he said, no, I, I can't do that. But here, I hope this helps you. And went on his way. He said that, um, he said, I had time for the greater kindness, but I missed the opportunity because I was busy with busyness. He said he took 10 steps from the man and he said that little voice on the inside said, you just missed a great opportunity. So he hurriedly turned around to look for him but the man was crossing the street and he was moving too quickly to be able to be caught. Mr. Mattern said he walked sorrowfully away with a lesson burning on the inside of him. It takes more than cash in my pocket to be an effective human. It takes preparedness. Where have we heard about that? A little purpose, intention. He said, it takes preparedness, mindfulness, an eye for opportunity, and decisive execution. He said, the irony was that my effectiveness was limited, not by the cash in my pocket, but by me. And then he may quoted the quote, we have met the enemy and he is us. <laughs> so his, his article and his lesson and, and all was, it was based on whether a cashless society can become a compassionless society. We're not here to have a discussion on a cashless society. And that's, that's not what we're here, but rather I want us to take a look at the lesson that Mr. Mattern learned. And then I want us to just get a, a mirror and I want us to look deep within ourselves and see if over these past few weeks while we have been studying the compassion of Christ, if we also have learned that same lesson. Have, have we learned that as Peter said, it is the end of time. Have we learned that we must live our life intentionally, purposefully, in a self-controlled manner so that we can be given to prayer? so that we can operate in the spirit of Christ's compassion. Have, have, we, have we learned this? Have we learned that it has nothing to do with the cash in our pockets that enables us to be an effective witness of the love of God? Have we learned that it takes preparedness, mindfulness, an eye that is looking for an opportunity 
followed by a decisively executed action. If we are to have the compassion of Christ, we must care, we must share, we must try, and we must believe in the fact that what we are trying will work when it is based on the word of God, when it is us acting in and on the compassion of Christ, when Christ's compassion is able to flow through us, it's going to cause us to care. It's going to cause us to share. It's going to cause us to try. And it's going to cause us to believe in what we are trying. If it is what God has told us to step out and do, then we can have faith that it is going to work. Amen. 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 So I want us to turn to Mark chapter 2. And this is going to be just a little bit of a lengthy reading, but I think it's okay because I want us to get I want us to get the whole story in our mind for tonight. Um, Brother Coley, would you stand and read for me in chapter two? And I want to do verses one through twelve. And again, he entered into Capernaum after some days, and it was noise that he was in the house. And straightway, many were gathered together, insomuch that there was no room to receive them, no, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them. And they come unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was. And when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. But there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. Why doth this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? And immediately, when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned within themselves, he said unto them, why reason ye these things in your hearts? Whether is it easier to say to the sick of the palsy, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise, and take up thy bed, and walk. But that ye, that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins, he saith to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise, and take up thy bed, and go thy way into thine house. And immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went forth before them all, insomuch that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw it on this fashion. Thank you. I, I love this story in the Bible. It, I always have. I just, there's something about this story that, that I just love. But when we're looking at this, we understand people have needs. Going, going back to even what Mr. Mattern was talking about, he was talking about the fact that he found himself in a place where that he had been unable to meet needs of people. Mm -hmm. And he realized it bothered him at first but then his attitude started changing. Until finally he just didn't even care. Mm -hmm. Finally it was just a bother that people with needs got in his way. All right. But I come tonight and I say, people have needs. Yes. I'm a people, how about you? Yes. I'm a people, I have some needs. Sure. People need miracles in their lives. Amen. And yes. this paralyzed man, he needed two. Yes. One was an internal miracle. 
It was a spiritual miracle that he had need of. It was invisible to the naked eye. Those around him maybe could not see it, but it involved the cleansing from sin and the forgiveness of sin. Mm -hmm. this, this was one, it was actually his ultimate need. Right. The second miracle that he needed was external. It was a physical, it was a verifiable need miracle that he needed it involved the unleashing of paralyzed limbs in a brilliant display of healing power and i believe that there are people all around us that we have contact with every day of our lives who need both kinds of miracles. Yeah. Yeah. And we are in the position of which Mr. Mattern spoke to be the one who is actually prepared, ready, and looking yeah. for the opportunity. Yeah. But often the reason that people don't experience miracles is that no one brings them to Jesus. In this um, story, some men came, four of them actually, carrying a paralytic. Perhaps they were members of his family. We don't know. But what we do know is that these men have learned what Mr. Mattern learned, what Jesus has been teaching Charleston UPT over the last several weeks. Right. Yes. Amen. Amen. To be the one who um, is prepared, ready, and looking for the opportunity. Yeah. Their names were not given, but there are four qualities in their actions which we need to look at and then we need to emulate. Yes. We need to so internalize these qualities into our own lives that we will be able to bring someone to Jesus and to witness a transformation miracle in their lives. I trust that as we look at this, that there's going to be something about these four men that motivates us to be a part of someone else's miracle. You know, I, I even today I was I was walking through my house and I would just my eyes would just fill with tears and I would just tell God, God, I want to be able to extend my hand and I want to be able to reach out and touch someone who has a need. I want to be part of their miracle. Yes. I want to see their internal need of sins forgiven, washed away, completely cleansed as if they never had sinned, coming up out of a watery grave of baptism with every sin remitted and stored 
one's yeah. miracle. Yes. Amen. 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 I don't want it to be said that there is someone that was within my reach that I passed them by and they had need of two miracles, one internally and one externally. But I hurried on by because I was busy with the busyness of life. I don't want to look back. The one, the one emotion that all of us fight against the most is regret. And I don't want to look back with regret. And I don't want to know people have needs and people are in need of a miracle. And the reason they don't receive it is because there was no one to extend a hand, no one to care, no one to share, no one to try, no one to believe that what they were doing was really gonna work. So I want something about these four men to motivate us in some way to let compassion just begin to burn on the inside of us for those who have a need. The first thing, and if you notice on the screen, compassion cares, and you look at the way that it's written, written out here, I'm gonna talk about the C of care, and that is Compassion. You see, there's an unstated motive in um, in this that it, it sets the whole miracle in action. And that is compassion. Before there was ever a hole pierced in, um, in this roof, a daring plan birthed in the hearts of these men. There's an atmosphere of an urgency there. You can, you can feel it. And it, it, it is a difficult for us to um, picture the disorder of the scene. If you think about this, there were curious people that were filling the streets. There were the expectant who were hurrying toward the place where the report was going out that, you know, hey, there's a free clinic in progress down there. If you've got a need, people are being healed down here, it's free. And people are coming in their expectancy, hurrying. There was dust and there was heat. There was noise, there was disease, there was rudeness. Think about that. There was only so much space and everybody wanted to get in there. There was jostling. There was crowding. But meanwhile, within a dark, low-ceilinged room stands a man who is radiating power and healing all that are coming within the reach of his hands. If you picture, close your eyes, you can picture it. You can see them coming up this narrow street. There's a, the group clustered all around these four men. You know how that works. Where are you guys going? What are you doing? Hey, they're gonna take him to see Jesus. And so the crowd's getting bigger and bigger as they're going along and you can see it, you can picture it. And here are these four men and they're struggling 
under the, the load and trying to carry this, this stretcher of, of a, a man who's prone and motionless and unable to help them in any way. When they get there, the crowd has blocked the stream of traffic. There's so much pressing around the door of the house. So many sick people trying to get in. So many with the need. So it looks really bad for this silent paralytic. Because his four friends, maybe they kind of set his stretcher down on the ground for a moment and they're mopping their brow and the sweat that's dripping off of them because of the load that they have carried for this man. And here they are and the situation looks pretty hopeless. They don't know how to, there's, there's four of them, there's this bed, they have, you know, they don't, they don't want to tilt him, they can't tilt him up and make him fall over, they're looking, they're trying to figure it out, what are, what are they going to do? So here they are, they're conferring, hurriedly trying to make a plan, a procedure. So they keep working their way around and they work their way around to the side of the crowd and Finally, they just have to stick their elbows out like everybody else and they kind of have to elbow their way and they kind of have to push and jostle some people. Okay. But with much pushing and heaving, they finally get around all the people and they find their way and they arrive on the top of the house. When they got to the top of the house, that's exactly where they were. They were on the top of the house. They were on the roof. There was no way in. But they did not let that deter them. Because their friend needed Jesus. Yes. Amen. They had a person yes. who had a need. And compassion was filling them on the inside. That whatever it took, they had to get this man to Jesus. Right. Yes. When you're motivated by compassion, right. yes. there's just not many obstacles that can stand in your way. Right. Mm -hmm. Amen. Bob Pierce, the founder of World Vision, Divine compassion in his prayer request. He said, Let my heart be broken with the things that break the heart of God. No greater request is there to ask God for the compassion of Christ to fill us. Right. Amen. All of us in this place tonight should be saying the same thing. Amen. Oh, God, let my heart be broken by the things that break your heart. Amen. Because that is what I'm going to be motivated by the passion. That is when I'm going to be able to operate in the flow of the Spirit. That's what I'm going to care. Amen. As you care. Amen. You know, we can all experience deep feelings about our own problems. Sure. Don't tell me that you don't. Because it, it does not matter male or female, you care about your own problems and you feel deeply and you get worked up over your own problems. Sure. But compassion is experiencing that same depth of emotion mm -hmm. for someone else right. okay. in their state of need. All right. All right. 
A minister tells about visiting famine victims in East Africa as he walked by a small stick-like child reached out and clung to his leg refusing to let go and it, he was he was so touched by this child's obvious need for love that he reached down to pick him up and as he did so his guide said do you know why that this boy is hugging you he said it's not because he wants love but because he's so malnourished that even this warm air feels very cold to him and he's holding on to your leg because it's warm and he's freezing and at that moment this man's perspective changed this was not an American child who enjoyed the luxury of intimacy, but here was a child literally starving, reduced to scrapping for survival. No child should have to give up the luxury of knowing what it means for a caring adult to hug them or hold them safe. No child should have to starve to death in the middle of a field while sacks of flour lie rotting in warehouses. Amen. And at this point, the man felt something grip his heart. I can tell you what it was because the Bible defines it. It was called compassion. People don't care how much we know until they know how much we care. And I'm going to repeat this to you yet again. The reason most people don't experience miracles and their needs of both salvation and external miracles and needs met is because no one brings them to Jesus. I, I read this picture of responses potential to the need this, this week, today actually, but a man fell into a pit and couldn't get himself out. A Christian scientist came along and said, in a pit. A Pharisee said, only bad people fall into a pit. A fundamentalist Christian said, you deserve your pit. An agent from the Internal Revenue Service asked, are you paying taxes on this pit? A charismatic said, just confess that you're not in a pit. An optimist said, things could be worse. A pessimist said, things will get worse. But Jesus, seeing the man, took him by the hand and lifted him up out of the pit. That's exactly what these men did. They were moved with compassion. Yes. Amen. They saw someone who had fallen into a pit, someone who yes. had a need. Yes. And they said, I'm going to do whatever it takes yes. to bring this need to Jesus. Amen. Compassion then always leads to the second quality found in this incident. And this is the A and it is action in verse three and they came unto him bringing one sick of the palsy you see there are many people who are moved and they're stirred and they're touched there are people who are very good to um, strategize and prioritize and there are other people who are good at envisioning and enabling. But there's an appalling dearth, a disturbing scarcity. 
see a people who will actually do something about someone else's problem. The excuses are legion and the justification for non-involvement. It seems so plausible. I'm sure you've heard it. I won't say that you've ever said any of them because it wouldn't be any of us. But what about, I don't have time. Oh, I don't, I don't want to get involved in that. Well, you know, I think somebody could do a better job than, than I could. Or, I have better things to do with my life. Can I say that you don't have to do everything, but you should do something. If everyone would do something, then someone wouldn't have to do everything. How often is it that, you know, we hear about no matter how big a church gets, that it's a core group of a few people who carry the load and who do the work. I was I was showing a pastor a, a video that I was sent of a um, an amusement park ride, and it's it's the one where the the wall is it's just a straight wall, and then the ride is on the front, and you you get into this car, and then it just it it goes like around in circles, and. Um, what, what actually was happening was that as this began to go around in the circles, it, it started lifting up, the front part started lifting up from the ground. And the person who shared it with me said, look what can happen when people pull together and work together. And all these, all these people came running. There started being yells, you know, it's starting to tip. And all these people came running and they climbed on the front of um, this ride and they were all standing on the front of it together. Well, they put all of their weight on there and they held the front of it down until that they could get the ride stopped and they could get all of the people off. And I thought about that in conjunction with, um, with what that I'm talking about here, about taking action. Yes. There, were, there were many lives that were saved because a group of people who were strangers to one another, they, didn't, they hadn't come there together. They were running from all over the um, park. They were just running as fast as they could. But strangers coming together because there were people, there was a need, yes. and they understood if we'll all bind together here and work together, this need of these people for their lives to be saved can be met. Right. Amen. How much more in the kingdom of God? Yeah. Because Amen. that is what is happening in life. Right. Right. People are on a, they're just on a circular ride that just is spinning faster and faster and they're losing control of their own lives. But if we can come together and bind together and we can be ruled with compassion and we can see here is a need. Now if we'll come together and we will take action then these people Situation. Yes. I ask 
tonight, oh God, give us stretcher bearers. Give us people who will move from compassion to action. Because the reason most people do not experience miracles in their lives is that no one brings them to Jesus. What if these four men had just left this paralytic to languish on his on his bed of inactivity and impotence. Mm-hmm. What if after dabbing their eyes and drying their tears, they just simply failed to act? Right. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Say it. That is precisely the point at which many of us fail mm-hmm. to Come be on. friends. To people in need. Tell it. Amen. Mm-hmm. That's right. Now, there's a reason we don't act. Because to act with compassion means to take a risk. Mm. Okay. And this is the art of care. Yeah. Verses 4 through 7 said, And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was, and when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. But there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, Why did this man... Thus speak blasphemies. Who can forgive sins but God only? You know, if you want to be who God created you to be, then not everything can be safe, ordered, predictable, and insulated. That's right. Oh, my. Come on. These men, they didn't wait until the house cleared Uh and all the people were gone. They didn't wait until another day. Mm -hmm. They did a strange thing. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it takes strange things to bring people to Jesus. Mm -hmm. Right. Wow. Okay. We have to take a risk. And yes, we will be hurt. Mm -hmm. Right. Let's just put it out there. If you take a risk, you're going to get hurt. Mm -hmm. Okay. And when we're hurt, the pain is just virtually unbearable. Mm -hmm. I know. I've been there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, we're going to be misunderstood. And that lack of understanding is going to be absolutely so frustrating. But risks must be taken or we will be wrapped in the cocoon of selfishness all our lives. Mm -hmm. All right. I, I don't Amen. I don't want to be wrapped in a cocoon of selfishness. Right? Mm-hmm. No. I want to be able to break out and I want to be able to break free and I want to be able to become the glass-winged butterfly that I was created to be. Mm-hmm. All right. yes. mm-hmm. There are some things that risk does here in, in verse 4. Risk was exhibiting persistence. You know, what if this doesn't work? That's the question, no doubt, that's in the back of their mind. They they arrive, and when they get there, their worst suspicions are confirmed. It said in verse 4, they could not get him to Jesus. That was the thing that they were there to do. Mm -hmm. There are too many people crowded around the door. Did you catch that? There are too many people that want to crowd around the door, but they don't want to push on in. They are, um, they're there because Jesus had just healed a leper. And that man's told absolutely everyone that he knows about it. Mm -hmm. 
So as a result, Jesus can't even move for the crowds that are around him and that are that are pressing in all around him. And people are there for um, from more than a hundred miles around. If that you go back and you look at the um, parallel um, passage in Luke. And so for for a lot of people, this would have been enough of a reason to turn around and go home. It's just too crowded. What keeps us from bringing people to Jesus? Many times the only barrier is our personal convenience. It's just too much trouble. For many others, the problem is that it just takes so long to bring a paralyzed person to Jesus. Because you see, sometimes it requires years of bearing a stretcher. Risk not only exhibits persistence, but it employs creativity. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus. Right above is what good speed says. And after digging through it, lowered the mat the paralyzed man was lying on. Climbing that exterior staircase, they began digging down through the mud, through the branches, through the twigs, through the matting, until that there is a hole. You see, it doesn't take long when everyone helps out to punch through. The owner of the house, I always, I've had a question about this. This has always been my thing. What did the owner of the house think? You know, was he so involved with so many people and, and, he, and he can't even move and all of a sudden he starts seeing like this little hole start in his, in his roof and, and he doesn't know what's going on and he can't get there. And so, you know, what? What in the world is this all, all about? What, what's going on? And, um, but I now know and I can tell you that the owner of the house did not mind of that I'm quite certain. And here's, I'll, here's why, I'll tell you why. Verse one of chapter two tells us whose house it was. This is from the NIV. It says, a few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. This was the adult house of Jesus. He didn't mind employing his skills as a carpenter to repair a roof that had been torn up by desperate men seeking a miracle, desperate for a miracle of someone who had a need. Wow. Can I tell you, do you, you don't, you know, yes, do you think that it would disturb me while I'm up here tonight and I'm trying to teach this lesson, even if I'm teaching this very lesson? If all of a sudden there started being a hole in the ceiling up here? Yeah, there'd be a little bit of a disturbance in here. Everybody's attention is going up to the hole. I can I can try to keep talking to you about how the compassion cares, but you know, there's a hole. Everybody's attention, everybody's looking up here. And finally I'm looking up here. Of course it disturbed the preaching of Jesus. Of course it interrupted the flow of ministry that was taking place at that time. But can, let me let me point out to you about the church in Acts. You know what we ought to be having? We ought to be having some disturbances during church. We ought to be having the preacher who is preaching the word of God and goes right on preaching the word of God. Well, over here, people are in the altar repenting. Well, over here, there's people with their hands thrown up receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Well, people over here being healed one. 
So these persistent, creative men teach us something else about risk, and that is that risk experiences the unexpected. Yeah. Mark 2, 5 said, when Jesus saw, and I kind of emphasized this when I was reading it a little bit earlier, when Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. Clearly, this verse teaches us that we can see God bless someone else on the basis of our faith for them. When they get to the point, maybe, maybe this, uh, this man, we, we just don't have a lot of history on him. But maybe he had been paralyzed from birth. Maybe he had had an accident and um, an injury and had become paralyzed. But maybe on this whole trip, while these four men are, are pushing through the crowd and while they're trying to haul him to the top of the house and even when they're lowering him, maybe all he can think is, I'm so scared. Am I going to fall off of here? Are they going to drop me? I, I, I don't know what's going to happen. Maybe he hasn't even been able to have the opportunity yet to concentrate on, oh, but I believe when I get there, Jesus is going to do this for me. But they believed for him. And Jesus looked at their faith. It just may be that somebody that is in our sphere, maybe they feel like I've gone too far. I have strayed away from God too far. I don't believe that he will meet my internal need for forgiveness of sin. I don't um, believe that he will minister to me. But yet, we can stretch our hand out and we can say, please just come with me. Because I believe, I believe what God will do for you. I'm willing to take the risk with expectancy of what God can do, what God will do, what is worth promising. I believe for you. Just come and give Jesus a chance. These men believe for a miracle. But what they received was not what they expected. Because they were coming and they were bringing him for a healing. But what Jesus knew is that what the man really needed was salvation. He needed to have his sins forgiven. His body was only going to be a problem for just a short time more. But his soul could be lost for all of eternity. And so now it was time for the real miracle. The one that was going to be eternal. Yeah. Amen. Anytime you see God at work, the enemy is going to try to stir up trouble. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, he does. But you see, risk not only exhibits persistence, employs creativity, experiences the unexpected, but it has to have this final quality. Risk endures criticism. Mark 2, 6 through 7. But there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. Why doth this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? Now, here's, here's something that you will find to be invariably true. 
People criticize what they don't understand. Right. People criticize what they under, don't understand. And obviously, these religious people, they didn't understand what, what was happening in this moment. Right. And so they criticized it. Sure. Ignorance is the basis of all unfounded criticism. Okay. And what they don't even understand is that what they're saying is true. Right. Who can forgive sins but God alone? But what they don't know is that this carpenter from Galilee standing in their midst with dust on the shoulders of his robe and the rubble of his own roof around his feet is God himself. Right, right. So the next time you're criticized, if it isn't true, remember, they didn't understand Jesus either. Do what you think is right, even if you know that you're going to get criticized. Right. Because risk endures criticism, mm -hmm. but it is always worth it to bring people to Jesus. Yes, amen. amen. Okay. Mm -hmm. Of course, there is one final quality that we have to name, and it's found in the last five verses of this miracle account. So we have the first ones. We have compassion and we have action, and we have risk, and last is expectancy. Mm -hmm. Expect Jesus to do the work when you bring people to him. Yes, amen. Okay. Don't just expect that you're bringing them to church. Right. Uh -huh. See, for too long we have operated in that kind of a mindset. Mm -hmm. All right. mm -hmm. Will you come and go to church with me? I'm bringing them to church. Mm -hmm. But see, we got to shake that off. Yes, right. We've got to understand. Right. No, if I am going to be filled with the care of compassion, then there's going to be an expectancy on the yes. inside of me. Yes, right. That yes. I'm not just bringing you to visit my service. No, no. no I am bringing you to me yes. with Jesus yes. Christ, yes. he's going to be there. He is going to meet your need. Yes. Bring them to Jesus, however that may happen. Right. Yes. Amen. Amen. All Amen. Right. Jesus yes. may meet them at Starbucks. Right. Jesus may meet them at Cracker Barrel. Jesus may meet them at Morton Park. Bring them to Jesus yes. wherever you find them. Because if you are there and you've got Jesus Christ on the inside of you, then they have just come to an encounter yes. with Jesus Christ. Amen. Right. Amen. Yes. It is Jesus who's going to touch them. It is Jesus who's going to change them. So you need to expect Jesus to know the true condition of their hearts. Mark 2, 8, and immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned within themselves, he said unto them, why reason ye these things in your heart? You see, God knows the real need. Better than anyone. Yes. Yes. Right. He sees the heart and yes. he knows it. Yes. He knows it better than you know it as a friend. You may know it to a certain point, but he knows it better than they know it themselves. Right. What the real need is, because he can meet them and he can perceive what the real need is. Right. Yes. Amen. And so. You need to understand that we can expect Jesus to speak to the true condition. Amen. Mark 2, 9 and 10 said, whether it is easier to say to 
the sick of the palsy, thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise and take up thy bed and walk, but that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins, he will speak through the Spirit and the Word. We've got to expect Jesus to transform lives in a dramatic fashion. Mark 2, 11 through 12, I say unto thee, Arise and take up thy bed and go thy way into thine house. And immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went forth before them all, insomuch that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw it on this fashion. Right, yes, right. tonight, I want to ask you, what about you? 
what, what about you? When will you choose to be set free? We never become free when we indefinitely postpone action. There are so many people who stay paralyzed because they live on someday aisle. Someday I'll pray. Someday I'll read my Bible. Someday I'll go to church. Someday I'll get saved. Someday I'll trust Jesus for deliverance. But the most effective way to deal with paralysis is to act today. And you see, we're all here tonight because God drew us here and drew us into this place. It wasn't of our own choice. It wasn't of our own decision. We may think that it was, but it was the drawing of God. It was God's compassion that looked down and saw each and every one of us. And God's compassion said, I see your need. And so he just beckoned us with that wooing and with that drawing. It is the care of God for each and every one of us that brought us here. We're here because of he cares. We want to reach out and touch people because we care. And because of the fact that we expect Jesus to touch through us to someone in need. Can we just bow our heads? I, I feel Jesus in this place, and I feel the gentle wooing of the Spirit. As Jesus says, I love you. I care. It was his compassion for mankind in their need for both internal and external needs that caused him to leave the glory of heaven and come to the earth below and to walk among men, to allow himself to be hung on the cross of Calvary to shed his blood whereby that we in our sins and trespasses can be forgiven. Whereby that we can be washed and made clean. Where we can be filled with his spirit that can give us the power to live an overcoming life. And it is his spirit on the inside of us that causes us to be filled and moved with compassion for those who have a need. And so he's here and he's wooing and he's saying, I'm here filled with compassion. And you are here and you are in my house and I welcome you. Oh, thank you, Father. Because it is my heart's desire to meet you where you are. To your compassion, God, to your love. Father God, I ask you that tonight. 
that you would just move across this congregation on this Wednesday night as we've come to talk about the fact that compassion cares. I ask you, Jesus, that you would help those of us who have experienced your salvation to be filled with your compassion, to not be um, limited just to dry our eyes and walk away, but God, let us take action. I'm praying and asking you, God. Let us take the risk and fill us with expectancy. Let us care. Let us share. Let us try. And let us be expected that what we are trying according to the word of God is going to work. And God, those that are among us that have never known you in the fullness of the plan of salvation, I ask you that tonight that your spirit would woo and your spirit would draw and your spirit would beckon and that your love and your compassion would be made overwhelming in this place. God, if we have been paralyzed in a life of sin, I know that tonight you desire to heal the internal needs and the external. And so I ask that we would give you the freedom to do it tonight. In Jesus' name. We lift you up, God. Oh,
he cares for you and how much he cares for me. Thank you, Jesus. There's been such a gentle flow of Jesus' love in this place tonight. We've talked about a lot of things about the compassion of Christ. The Lord started us off talking to us about camel need compassion, having a burden, loving, carrying people on our knees to the throne of God. He's talked to us about the fact that we've got to live intentionally each and every day. We've got to live a purposeful life. He's talked to us about self-mastery. Because self-mastery is necessary in order for there to be compassion. And in order for the compassion of Christ to be able to flow through us. But then he's come tonight and he's taken all of these lessons. And he's wrapped them all up together. And he says, compassion cares. You've got to have the compassion. You've got to take action. Yes, there's going to be risk involved. But you've got to have the right expectancy about what will happen. And I leave you with the thought-provoking question and answer. that Brother James Lumpkin left with me that I have never forgotten and I've carried it for years. I carry it on the sticky note that I wrote it on that I stuck inside my Bible. When is a man using that term to mean humanity? Or I could say, when is a person a failure? When you don't care, when you don't share, when you don't try, and when you don't believe that what you are trying is going to work. And I follow it up with, let's make it our prayer. God, fill me with the compassion of Christ. And let me be a stretcher bearer. Yes, God. Yes, God. For some, we've carried the stretcher for a lot of years. Trying to get them in to the house yes. that belongs to Jesus. You see, we need to stop and take a look at where was Jesus filled with compassion? It was walking down the road. It was out amongst the multitude. This one was in his house. But most of those miracles happened as he was passing by people and he looked and beheld 
People have needs and people need miracles. And so he stopped, moved by compassion and met the need right where they were. Jesus, help us to stop yes. as we are moved with compassion right where the people are and extend a hand for the need to be met. And oftentimes, it's that external miracle that is actually the appetizer that then draws them in to the banqueting hall That's of the right. Lord. That's right. So let God use you Amen. to be the one that extends your hand. You pray and expect yes. that as you try, that what you're trying is going to work. That's right. Amen. 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 Mm -hmm. Amen. Then maybe when you do get them inside the house, mm -hmm. that external need will already be met. Mm -hmm. And hopefully even the internal one because hopefully you've been able to repent with them. You've been able to see them filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And you're bringing them into the house for baptism. Right, yes, amen. Mm -hmm. One more time. Thank you, Jesus. Can we just ask Jesus to make us a stretcher bearer? Mm -hmm. 